Now, what you're going to what we're going to be seeing is not simply a correction within a bull market, but most probably, or not, not most probably, but a greater than random probability. Let's put it that way: that the great bull market that began in March 2009 uh, ended uh, in March 2024, and we will have a um, sort of a great uh, a, a bear market ahead of us. Milton Berg joins the show. He is the CEO of MB Advisors. He was on the show a couple of times last year, and last summer he correctly called the top. Click on the link down below or up here for what he said. Watch the video from last summer to understand his rationale because he's doing the same thing again. He's calling for a uh, potential bear market in the stock markets. He's short the stock markets. We'll find out why. He's also short Bitcoin. He'll explain why. And he'll run us through why he thinks deflation, not inflation, is next. And this episode is sponsored by Moomoo. If you're watching this right now and you're new to the channel, subscribe now to get daily timely updates on markets, the economy, and watch interviews with experts on finance. Welcome to the show. Milton, welcome back. Yes, David. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Let's just talk about stocks first. You have a report that came out recently on NB Advisors uh, as of April 19th. We see some evidence of a potential tradable low forming in the equities markets. Although these indications are necessary components of a low, they are not sufficient. We will continue to incrementally increase short exposure. Tell us about your process and why you're adding to your short exposure now uh, with the stock markets um, where they are. Well, basically, we're currently about 100, recommending 130% short exposure. If we be aggressively short, it'd be 175% or higher on the short side. Uh, uh, the fact that it's only 130% doesn't mean that we're uh, we're not bearish, we're quite bearish, but uh, generally we find, we think there's a quite uh, a strong probability that what, you're going to, what we're going to be seeing is not simply a correction within a bull market, but most probably, or not, not most probably, but a greater than random probability, let's put it that way, that the great bull market that began in March 2009 uh, ended uh, in March 2024. And we will have a um, sort of a great uh, a, a beer market ahead of us. However, we know that every beer market, early in beer market, there are always uh, country trend rallies. And we're probably going to get short, aggressively short after the first rally. Now, when I say this, I know, for example, there, the great the, the beer market in 1973-74, for example, uh, saw a series of of 3% rallies, 3 to 4% rallies, about four of them, um, as the market was declining, early in the decline. But that, that's a standard bear market lasted about two years or so. In a crash-type market, you generally see a, a stronger rally. In 1929, you saw a, uh, a nearly 6% rally lasting four days uh, before the crash took place. In 1987, you, you saw roughly a 7% rally taking something like 12 days before the before the 87 crash took place. So whether in a bear market, uh, I mean, it would be down, say, 50% in the next two years, or whether in a crash, down 30% in the next three months, we're going to wait for the first rally and see what the technical condition of the market is, or what the um, uh, the action inter internal action of the market is, and then we'll decide whether we go aggressively short. But we're going to wait for that rally. Now, if the market continues straight down without a rally, we'll be 130 percent short um, on the way down. But uh, uh, based on history, the probabilities are there'll be some sort of a rally, which will get the the uh, bulls bullish again and get the bears to cover some of their shorts. And if that's the case, we'll use that opportunity to go uh, a greater short position if the evidence does not change. At this point, the evidence is still bearish. The evidence has not changed. Now, we we basically started turning bearish on February 8th. Now, it's, people say February 8th. Well, the market was booming in February 8th. Well, that's exactly the point. On February 8th, we started seeing climax action in the in the in the um in the market leaders. We we started seeing climax action and we decided to, to initial initiate a 20% short position. What we told the clients is we're going to take 20 of the most outstanding stocks and take a 1% position in each of them, equally weighted, and short them. Now, um, uh, uh, some of the stocks, for example, that we shorted was uh, um, uh, Firm Holdings, for example. Uh, we we shorted uh, NVIDIA, we shorted Advanced Micro Devices, we shorted Ser ServiceNow, Power Outlaw Networks, and so on and so forth. Zscaler, some of the great, great, great stocks that, that were really doing very, very well. Um, currently, um, I think uh, through Friday's close, our basket is making us 6.24%. In other words, we shorted those stocks. At the time, even many of my clients who are familiar with the kind of work I do, they Milton, how can you be shorting these stocks? The momentum is so strong now. Uh, well, markets peak on, these type of stocks peak on peak momentum. Uh, uh, speculative stocks do not peak on, on a weakening of momentum. Speculative stocks peak on peak momentum. 
However, most analysts wait for momentum to turn down, wait for the, the stocks to turn down before they go short. We don't mind shorting into strength when the evidence is suggesting that a market peak is nearby. So basically, we're up 6.24%, while the S&P over that period since February 8th is only down 0.61%, and the net, even the NDX is only down 4%, and the SOX is down 3%, our short exposure has gained 6.24%. So, so far, it's done well. If we are correct that a bear market is, is it may be ahead of us, I'm not saying it is ahead of us, but a bear market may be ahead of us, these stocks that led to the upside should lead to the downside as, as well. As you've seen in many, many bear marks in history, we've seen it in the 73, 74, we saw it in 2000 to 2002, uh, we saw it in, 19, in 2007 to 2008, and of course we saw it from 1929 to 1932, the great leaders, the Radio Corporation of America and so on, which, were the, which was the NVIDIA of those days, uh, was, was, were actually the weakest stocks on the way down. Okay, well, we're speaking today on the Sunday, 21st of April, as of today. The, the S&P closed on Friday, 49.67. I'm looking at the screen. It's down about 5 5 5.5% since its highs in March. Milton, what do you mean by a bear market? Well, I would argue we're already in well, when, one, right? Yes. Well, when we were, when we were short, uh, we, we, you know, we, we, we do what, what we call turning point analysis. We try to pick market tops. We try to pick market bottoms. But we don't try necessarily try to project how much of a decline you will get when the market peaks. Occasionally, you get a decline of only 3 4 or 5%. Occasionally, you get a corrective decline of 5 of, of 5 uh, 10 12%. And occasionally you get a bear market. You can't always tell at the time you get a sell signal whether the market will be headed for a bear market or just a correction. A prime example is we got a tremendous sell signals in July of 2007. And the SP declined some 10%, but then rallied right back up to a new high in October. So with the, the, that, that decline was 10%. The ultimate decline was more than 50%, but that's after a minor new high back in October. So uh, uh, when we when we went short, we for all we know it was only a, a five or ten percent decline, and then the market may rally back to new highs. But now that we're in, it, we're in the decline, you know, we're already more than a, a few weeks in. Now there are more than, we're more than a few weeks into the decline. It's most likely that uh, what we saw is a, a beginning of a bear market or beginning of a, a, a greater greater than a normal correction of you know three five seven percent, probably a correction of. 10, 15% in the NASDAQ or, or in the SP 500. Currently, uh, the S&P, as I said, is, as you said, is, is, is down 5.91% intraday from its highest to lows. On a closing basis, it's down 5.46%. But the evidence as we see it would, would suggest that the type of top we saw in March uh, uh, basically was a top that will lead to a, a, probably a, 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 a possibly a very, a very strong bear market. I like to make a very, big, very, very, very big point that analysts Really, really, I find many analysts are confused about this. I don't want to see any names with very famous value analysts who say, well, the market is now as overvalued as it ever was in history. And so, say, so for example, in 1929, when, it, when the overvaluation was, was very similar to the current overvaluation, the market declined some 85%. And in 2000, when the market, uh, when the NASDAQ was overvalued, uh, to a, not to, to, to a great extent, it also declined 80%. But the reality is, that the reason the market declined 80% in 1929 is not because the market was overvalued. Benjamin Graham himself made this mistake. In his book, Security Analysis, he said, well, the reason the market had, you had the great bear market because the market was so overvalued in 29. No, no, it was overvalued in 29. But the reason it had the great bear market was because it was followed by a great depression. An overvalued market that is not followed by a great recession or great depression will not decline 90% necessarily, it just wouldn't. Uh, so I, I think that uh, if you try strictly using value analysis to understand the market, you're missing the point because value may tell you a, a, a possibility of, of a, a, a large move, but it doesn't necessarily tell you the, the extent of the move. But now currently, now currently, I think I think that the valuation overvaluation is now uh, coinciding with economic uh, uncertainty, possibility of, of deflation ahead of us possibility of a major recession ahead of us, and um, Ill, uh, possibility of major illiquidity ahead of us, possibility of bank failures ahead of us. So I think possibly if this is a bear market beginning, it may be, one, it may be a stark bear market ahead of us. Can Maybe. you please comment on this that you wrote? We still are of, this is a follow-up to what you said about deflation. We still are of the opinion that later this year we will see evidence of deflation rather than increasing inflation. Right. We we'll say this because in a sound monetary system, which the Fed is attempting to maintain, it is nearly impossible to generate increasing inflation while government debt to GDP ratios are at 
increasingly dangerous levels. Milton, this is um, contrary to what I've been hearing from other economists who have told me that when the government debt rises, that is when you get inflation because they would have to presumably either have to um, inflate the debt away through additional quantitative easing. Right. So firstly, you notice I mentioned in an, if you have an honest Fed, an honest Fed does not inflate, does not inflate the, the debt away. Now, you know, one of the questions the economists, these same economists who are so sure we're going to have inflation, they were so sure if the 2008 financial crisis will be followed by great inflation, and we were not. And no one understands why we were not. The reason we were not because inflation, um, in, in, in a monetary system we have in the United States, which is a true monetary system, meaning it's not it's not like Argentina or Zimbabwe, um, anytime the government spends money, they have to borrow the money. If they borrow the money, there's a liability. If there's a liability, they're going to have to pay back the liability. So therefore, um, um, uh, there's really no, it, it, nothing is being inflated. They borrow money and, and there's a liability that they have to pay down. But the, paying down is deflationary. Now that the, the debt to GDP on a nominal basis is over 100%, and on a real basis, if you look at the off-balance sheet uh, debt to GDP at maybe 200 or 300%, um, it, it's just basically deflationary. The government is going to have to stop spending and they're going to have to start paying down debt. And it's not just governments. It's it's, it's uh, corporations, it's individuals. It's uh, you know you have you have crisis in the CRE, you have crisis in, in mortgages, you have housing prices, which are really in a deflationary beginning of a deflationary spiral. It's just being covered up by the fact that the home builders are giving incentives. So on the books, it looks as if prices are remaining flat, but the reality, prices are declining. But again, I say when if you, if something think, look at look at an individual person. If I if I borrow money. I borrow money, I have to pay the money back. And I spend the money, I buy, I buy houses, I buy cars, I do on trips. Well, eventually, I'm going to be in the recession myself. Because I have to pay, I don't, where am I going to get the money to pay down my debt? I, I, I got to pay it back. I borrowed the money. The government is no different. The government borrows money and they borrow more than they're able to afford to, to spend. Eventually, they're going to have to pay down that debt and that's deflationary. Every great deflationary crisis began with an increase in debt. In 1929, Debt to GDP was basic where it was where it was not now, and it did not lead to inflation, it led to deflation. So yes, economists are basically wrong. They have really have very poor understanding of the monetary system. I've been saying this in 2008. I worked for one of the great uh, money managers, and his whole team was talking about inflation, inflation, inflation. And I said, no, inflation is not a risk. In fact, um, the, the risk is disinflation or deflation. I say the same thing currently. The, the blip we had in inflation over the last few years Although some of it had to do with the fact that you, there was um, uh, the, the, some debt was monetized, most of the inflation really was COVID-related, uh, supply-side related. It really was not the type of monetary inflation you see in Argentina, you see in, uh, in Venezuela, you see in Germany, in the Weimar Republic, or you see in Zimbabwe. That is not the kind of inflation we had. And therefore, the great surprise at the end of the year, I believe, will be turning towards deflation, deflation in, in, in housing prices, Deflation in in um, uh, disinflation in wages, and um, and uh, of course real estate, uh, commercial real estate. I think there's probably be some small bank failures, not necessarily large bank failures, but all deflations begin when there's great borrowing. They begin after great borrowing. They don't begin when there's no borrowing. So I, I disagree with those economists. Certainly, follow up to a couple of follow ups to what you said. You you said that we're most likely getting a recession, and you wrote about this. You said one aspect of a market crash is the nearly unanimous view at the top and during the crash pattern that a recession cannot be in the cards. Mm -hmm. Currently, the idea that a recession lies ahead of us has already begun is dismissed. Yes. Uh, this is despite the overwhelming evidence that a recession does lie ahead of us. What right. is this overwhelming evidence? Well, first of all, everyone looks at gross national product, the gross domestic product. Gross domestic income has been flat for two years. So you know the, the economy supposedly the growth, spending is growing, but income is not growing. It's, it's a very very poor combination because gross domestic product measures spending. Gross domestic income measures income. If spending is increasing and income is not, what what follows? What follows is deflation and follows is a recession. Number one. Second, the yield curve it has a stellar record. The fact that the yield curve um, has been inverted for what, uh, two years already has been inverted. People say, well, the yield curve no longer counts. Well, maybe it's just a greater a lead time for the yield curve to lead to a recession. And in fact, yield curve inverting does not lead to recession. It's when the yield curve inverts and then disinverts that the recession begins. So we really have to worry about what's the yield curve disinverse. And once you start seeing the three year uh, below the 10 year, and then you the, the three months below the 10 year, and then you're going to start, uh, that's when you have to worry about the recession. But the inverted yield curve is followed by recession. And there's no reason to think this time is any different. Consumer confidence. 
If you look at the ratio of, of, consumer, uh, of consumer confidence relative to the expectations for future for the future, it's been a, a it's been in a decline. I think for uh, for uh, 22 months in a row, or maybe 25 months in a row, which is also generally leads to recession. In other words, consumers are spending money because they're earning money now, but they're not confident about that they'll be earning money in the future. And his, historically, this is what takes place before recession. Hiring plans uh, by c- companies have been in decline since early 2022. If you look at, so even though hiring has been going up, but statistically, the hiring plans, have, companies have been uh, um, um, skeptical that they will be able to continue hiring. Of course, and home builders are slashing prices through incentives and so on. Leading economic indicators it had one up month in March, uh, but it, it, it's down 24 in the last 25 months. The leading economic indicators is, uh, is something that leads to recession. Now, of course, uh, one of the great leading economic indicators is the stock market. So the stock market, since uh, October of 2022, has been uh, suggesting that we will not have a recession. But now that there's a peak in the stock market, now the stock market may be telling us it's a recession. In other words, rather than look whether or not, uh, what, ra- rather than try to predict whether there'd be a recession ahead of us, we don't do that. We look at, we try to predict what the market is going to be doing. It's far easier to predict the market they predict what the Fed is going to do, or just try to predict a big recession based on economic figures. Well, well here's the thing: if, if many, many, many negative signs. If a recession is baked, one might argue, Milton, if a recession is baked in the cake, like you may suggest, based on the data, the Fed would already be pivoting by now, but they're not, right? Well, the Fed is the worst one of the worst economic uh, forecasts. Is, 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 let's face it: uh, every economic crisis occurred because the Fed uh, did not um, uh, uh, project the, the, the economy properly. And we go back to 1929, go back to 1966 to 1982, or that, that the great inflationary period, you know, when the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was uh, was flat, you know, that 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, but on a real basis, it's down over 60% because of inflation. So, no, the Fed, the Fed is, uh, is not a... The Fed, you know, the Fed is just a bunch of people, mostly academics, who really have very little uh, knowledge of markets, very little knowledge about the economy. How many people in the Fed ever ran a business? How many people in the Fed um, uh, really um, uh, have correct have correctly predicted the economy? The economy. Look at the the the, the, the dot plots. I mean, the Fed the Fed is just a bunch of people, you know, some portfolio managers, some institutions, and they're as wrong as everybody else. So the fact that the Fed hasn't slashed prices is because they're looking at employment, which is a, which is a lagging indicator. They're looking at they, uh, they must they must have insights and data that. The ordinary fund manager does not have. Well, I'm just speculating. If they haven't, they haven't been very successful. Let's look at right. the, they, they've never been very successful. Look at Bernanke, 2007 crisis with a housing crisis. Nobody, nobody predicted it. The, I mean, let's. I, I, I'm not. I have no. I have very little confidence in the Fed. I mean, I don't even think you need a Fed. Fed was created in 1913 when the, you know there was there was it was a sort of a socialist idea to have a central bank. The United States did not need a central bank. Each individual bank could issue their own currency. No reason to have a central bank, but you know, central bank is communism and socialism. But we do have a central bank, and a central bank is not healthy for the uh, strength of the economy. It's certainly not healthy for the typical United States citizen. It's very helpful for the uh, the Goldman Sachs type uh, uh, partners who, who who benefit from the inflationary moves of the Fed, but it's not be- it's not beneficial to a, a person who wants to save money and and stash um, in his pillow because ultimately the Fed allows inflation, even the creeping 2% inflation. Where did the Fed get the idea that a 2% inflation is ideal? It makes absolutely no sense. The ideal is 0% inflation, not 2% inflation. It absolutely makes no sense. So I, I believe is- they copied that from the Bank of New Zealand way back. Um, yeah. But that's a different conversation. So you yeah. don't believe that the, just we're, we're, we're going off topic, but this is an interesting conversation. You don't believe that there should be a central authority to moderate inflation and regulate unemployment? Definitely not. Well, unemployment was controversial at the time. It was Hubert Humphrey in the 1960s who, who put in that second uh, second uh, uh, um, uh, idea that besides the Fed uh, uh, controlling the money supply and inflation, they should be worried about employment. The Fed should not be worried about employment at all. Um, employment is a is a side effect of of uh, of good monetary policy. You get good monetary policy, then you'll have uh, nice employment. But you, you, the Fed shouldn't try to goose up employment. It doesn't. The truth, it doesn't even work. But yeah, that's that's my opinion. I'm not, that's not controversial. Maybe controversial to, but at the time. It was really a very very liberal move by one senator who sort of forced it forced that bill to allow the Fed to monitor both uh, employment and uh, and inflation. Okay, well, let's turn back to the markets. If it is true that the markets don't believe that a recession is in the cards, as you write, well, why did we get a five and a half percent correction? What was that? Re- what was that reacting to? 
Oh, well, a correction, a 5% correction is nothing. A 5 correction is a random event. Okay. Well, it wasn't, all, there wasn't a specific I'm catalyst? Wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Okay. And we had a random correction, and the correction may be over today, and then tomorrow the market may be rallying back to new highs. That, that, just looking at the market action itself, it's easy to say it's just a random correction. And strangely enough, many, many people are saying that. Most of the people who have been bullish into the top are saying it's just a random correction. It, it, it's a healthy correction. It was a ne- it's a necessary correction. But that's not the way I see it. We saw we we had a, a number, a, quite a number of buy signals in November, and December. No, we we turned bullish, of course, in October of 2022. Uh, we, uh, but uh, but uh, we we actually, I think I was on your show. We called the correction from July to to October of, of 2023. In, in at late October, in November, December, we got many, 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 many buy signals suggesting the market will 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 approach 5,000 and get even above 5,000, which it did. So we met our minimum objectives, but now as the market rallied in January and February and March, we got no new buy signals, but we got evidence of tops. Now we got evidence in many, many areas. We got evidence, of course, in the sentiment area. We got evidence in the fact that you saw what you call blow off action or, or climactic action in, in a, a, a very narrow group of industries. And you saw confirmation of a top by the fact that although the S&P 500 was making new highs and the NASDAQ was making new highs, the real companies that are affected by the economy, like the SP 600 or the Russell 2000, did not make new highs. They held the the, the back the, the, the highs were, were created back were generated back in November of 2021. So um, we we don't think that we think this is a, this type of market where you're starting to see where you see a, a narrowness where the market is only led by a, a a small number of stocks is a sign of a top. Now I don't I know that bull markets can take place with only a handful of stocks leading the market. We saw that into the top in 1972. We saw it into the top in the, in the 2000, and we saw it into the top in 1987. But this is a little bit different because what we did is this is a unique uh, unique approach. We took the we took the five greatest market cap stocks in the S&P 500, and, and we I, I I didn't prepare the chart for this interview, but I I can just tell you what it's what the chart shows us. We took the top five stocks. The five top stocks in the SP 500 represent 24.5% of the total market cap of the SP 500. In other words, five stocks is 24.5% of the market cap. The, the only time we've ever seen that in history was at the top, exact top in 1973. Actually, the numbers match. I think it was 23.8% in 19, at the top in January 11th, 1972, and it's 24.4% on March 21st of 2024. So five stocks represent 20, nearly 25% of market cap. In the year 2000, five stocks only represented 14% of market cap. So this is another interesting feature of this market, suggesting that uh, there's something very, very out of uh, out of whack by the fact that only five stocks represent 25% of the market. That's a, a, another little thing we look about look at. So A, we're looking at the fact that uh, there's been very poor participation. The broadening they talked about did not take place. And we actually thought the broadening will take place. We, 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 we turned bullish in November, in October, actually October, we'll get to that a little later on, late October, and, and we got buy sales in November. We thought that the uh, the Russell 2000 will lead to the upside. It actually led until December 29th, and then it's basically flat since then. The SP 600 is flat since then. So the broadening that people were talking about never took place. Had it taken place, we wouldn't be bearish now. But the fact that it did take place suggests that the 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 uh, the bear market uh, in the in the small caps, which began in 2020, and should continue. And this uh, this blow off we had in the SP 500 and the Nasdaq is strictly blow off action. Now we did a, a study of blow offs. You know, people use the term blow off. What is a blow off? Blow offs are most more common in commodity markets, not, not as common in stock markets, but you've had a number of blow-offs. Basically, you look at the last correction before the final, before a rally. Uh, the last correction we had was, was a 10% decline into the into late October. We rallied some uh, more than 20% in the S&P 500 with not even a pullback of, of 3% during that period. This is blow-off action, and this is the kind of action you saw into the 1929 top but you never had this type of a blow up before history. You never had one where you saw a, a, a greater than 20% decline lasting over 100 days in which you did not have a pullback of 3%. So uh, we will rather look at that as, as, as healthy momentum. We're looking at, at this as, 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 as a negative blow off. Now, as I said, if there would be full participation, if the bank stocks would have been acting well, if the small stocks would be acting well, then we'd say, well, this is not a blow off. This is a, a continuation of the, of the market. But if had that happened, we would have gotten buy signals. As I said, our last buy signal, you know, we have thousands and thousands of indicators. And, I, and as you've seen in my reports, 
Uh, we, we, we had, uh, I think, 60 or 70 bicycles in November and December of last year. Our last single was in late December, and we haven't had not, not one bicycle since since December. So interesting enough, the the uh, the S&P 600 basically peaked in December. Even the Russell 2000, it, 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 it tried to break out of its December high, but now it's below it. So uh, now these things look very negative for me. They're just one, you know, some of the things we're looking at. There are many, many other technical factors and market factors that are quite negative here. Can you just elaborate on your rationale one more time about the divergence between the large caps and the Russell 2000, the small caps and the mid caps? Why is it that when we've seen a divergence in the past, it's mean it, it means that usually a bear market follows? Could it not mean this time that the Russell just catches up to the S&P on the upside? Mm -hmm. Russell may catch up, but the problem is not catching up. The momentum of the Russell is, is lower than the momentum of the S&P. If the off the October lows into the current March peak, the Russell would have been exhibiting greater momentum than the S&P, then you'd say, well, the, the, the market is broadening. But as the market rallies, and, they, and if, as it rallies, it, it's nar it narrows, that is also a negative sign. I'm not the first one to discover this. You know, the, the technicians used to talk about the, 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 the troops following the generals and so on and so forth. So now the troops aren't following the generals, is what they say. I don't use that terminology, but basically we look at statistically, and we, I, you know, I'll give you the basic, the, the great example. I, I say 29, because 29 was the mother of all bear market, not because the market declined as much as it did, because it's the bear market that led to a Great Depression. In other words, it's a bear market that was justified uh, by, the, by the economic conditions. Many bear markets are not justified. I mean, the bear market of 2000, of 2000 to 2002 really was just uh, correcting an, over, an overvalued market. There was no Great Depression, even no Great Recession. There, there was just one or two minor recessions over the period. But um, in 1929, for example, there was just a handful of stocks taking the market up for the, those two years into its final peak, October 29. European markets peaked two years before, and the typical stock in the United States actually had a, had a very reasonable P-E ratio. The market as a whole had a high P-E ratio, of course, to the leading stocks. You see the same kind of things now. You know, you have... Uh, you have the uh, these high tech stocks, the metal, the fangs, whatever. You want. I don't follow things in that way, but the, the, there's sort of a mania in in high tech. There's a mania in, um, in in information technology, and that's been taking the broad market up. But if we're worried about a reset, if you're worried about if you're thinking coming out of a smart, of an economic slowdown, if you're thinking we're cutting going into a, a continued economic growth, if you're thinking going into continued economic growth with low inflation, the great beneficiaries would be the banks. At the bank stocks and the and the uh, small cap companies. Small cap companies are most uh, disturbed when there's financial uh, 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 when there's difficult financial situations. So if there's been an easing of financial situations, you should see the small cap stocks do far better than the big cap stocks, which is actually historically nearly every bull market sees the small caps outperforming the large cap. I mean, nearly every single one. You're not seeing it now, and I'm saying the reason you're not seeing it now is because it's not a healthy bull market. It was a predictable market. It's a bull market we expected, expected but as it ends, it's, it could end in, in, in major trouble. Again, I'm not saying it has to happen. For all I know, the market bottomed on Friday, but we have no evidence for that at this point. If we get evidence, we don't mind on that. For the people watching uh, this program right now, you can click on the link down below or here, up here for uh, Milton's last interview with me. Well, not last, I think we had two, but uh, the Milton's interview with me last summer when he correctly called the correction and you can revisit some of his rationale back then. One last point from your report that I wanna bring up to you, Milton, and I encourage people to check out MB Advisors. You have a whole document of, of many, many points as to why this correction may be happening, this bear market may be happening. We won't have time to go through all of them, obviously, but there's another one. Um, was brought to my attention. I like I, I like you to address this. High margin debt at the top oh, yes. is another important feature of a prelude to a market crash. Although yeah. margin debt peaked at the top in 2021, along with the small cap index six, there remains a seriously troubling feature of margin debt that has gone unnoticed by analysts. Why is this important? Yes. No. Okay. This is very important. And I like to discuss too. Let's discuss margin debt. Margin usually, usually, uh, margin debt peaks along with the market, you know, because people are speculative. And, and margin, in this case, since margin debt peaked in in 2021, along with the speculative stocks, people are suggesting, well, this bull market hasn't ended because it's going to end when margin debt is at a new high. So that's a a, a logical argument, and I, I have no problem with that argument on its own. However, there's a feature in in, in the market that is being ignored, um, and uh, and that is that. You have to look at margin debt relative to free credit balances. You have to look at margin debt, the ratio of margin debt to cash 
in the uh, in the clients um, in the clients accounts and that has now gone to a record ratio and the re margin debt relative to the cash in the accounts is at its highest level in history it's higher than it was at the 2000 peak and it's higher than it was at the uh, 2018 market peak and higher than it was at the 2021 market peak so although margin debt is below uh, the levels we've seen in 2021 but the ratio of margin debt to cash so meaning basically if a this is a technical view if the market is going to decline, there's very little cash available to um, to support the margin debt. Now, people have to liquidate stocks rather than put up cash uh, to cover their margin debt. That's just another thing. I like to mention some other things as long as we're, we have a few more minutes to discuss the market. There, there are many things we haven't touched upon. If that's okay with you, David, I'm not sure. Okay, you know, there are certain things that take place in the market that are not random. See, if something is random. Um, it, it really has no effect on money. For example, people are saying, people are saying, well, there's so much money in, in money market funds, the market's going to go up. First of all, that's not a fundamental. It's funny to hear that from fundamental analysts. There's nothing fundamental about cash in a, cash in a, in a money market fund to suggest that a stock is undervalued. It has to go up. That it makes no sense. But the reality is that people buy or sell a stock. Let's say there's money in a money market fund. Someone takes it and buys a stock. Well, the person who sold the stock now has cash. He puts it in his money market fund, or he puts it someplace else. Cash never changes. The cash in the system never changes. You know, cash is very fungible. You buy a stock, the one who sold it to you gets the cash. What does change is value. When stock market, when the stock market goes down, whether or not cash changed hands, the value of the index or the value of the stock or the worth of the individual who owns the stock or institution who owns the stock has declined if it goes down or has advanced if it goes up. So it's very makes very little sense to look at the so-called money flows and cash flows and money and money market instruments. That's something you should not look at. But uh, I just want to point that out. So the fact that they, they're claiming there's so much money in money market funds uh, that's going to go to stocks when the Fed eases or when the rates go down is really irrelevant to a market analysis. What's the market doing now? What the market's doing now is generating a series, series of what they call exhaustive gaps into the highs in March. So, for example, uh, uh, let's look at the SOX index, which is which was the leading index. The SOX, the, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, it was up 65%, more than 65% off its October low to its high, which occurred on March 8th. Now, on March on March 7th, a, 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 a gap took place. In other words, after a long run, 65% up move, all of a sudden people are, are, are rushing to get into that index to such an extent that you had an upside gap the day before the final high. These are one of the characteristics of a speculative top. So, so you saw that in the SOX index. You also saw that in in, um, in other indexes. You see it in the X, you saw it in the, in, in, in the SPX. Uh, I want to point something else out because um, the Nikkei, people are going crazy by the fact that the Nikkei made a new high. The Nikkei index picked back uh, in December 31st, 1989, and it finally made a new high in 2024. And people are saying, wow, this is amazing. Well, it's not so amazing. First of all, it's up 5.46% above its December 29th, 1989 intraday high. So you're talking about how many years is that? Uh, I don't know, 40 years. Who knows what it is? It's, 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 it's 30, more than 30 years. It's up 5.46%. Of course, adjusted for, for life, that's nothing at all. But the reality is this index also peaked at the same time the U.S. indices peaked basically on March 21st with an exhaustion gap. We're very negative on worldwide. If we're negative on the U.S. markets because we think there may be a recession ahead, we're certainly negative on worldwide markets as well. And and, and Japan is not going to be saved just because of the fact that they had a flat market for for twenty years, for forty years or so. I think I think Japan is also a a a, 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 a prime candidate to be a to, to decline. I mean, it had a ma it had a major run up, it had a major bull market, it had a major blow off like like we did. The fact that it just exceeded its high of December 12, 1989, I think is irrelevant for market analysis. Um, but I want to point out something else we do. We have some, besides the, the, the basic fundamental uh, technical work that we do, we also have some proprietary work, which uh, work was discovered by a fellow named Paul Montgomery, who basically uh, did what we call cycle work. And cycle work is very fascinating. Now, when I use this term cycle work, people basically say, what's this guy talking about? He's out of his mind. But I notice, you know, I, I listen to CNBC occasionally, and I certainly listen to some of your interviews and some other interviews. And it's, it, I find it so strange that people who are supposedly fundamental analysts, who supposedly analyze the economy and analyze the value of companies, use terms such as seasonality. You know, what does seasonality have to do with valuation? 
Use terms such as money flows. What does money flows have to do with, with valuation? They talk about, you know, the, the, the Goldman Sachs just put a report that the first two weeks in May are usually very, very bullish. What is, what's a great company like Goldman Sachs talking about two, a two-week period where markets do well? Isn't that most likely just a random event? Can't you go back in history and find periods where, you know, where, where markets do well? And it, it absolutely makes no sense. But yet these people with a straight face talk about seasonality, January effects. They talk about all these kinds of things that have nothing to do with their expertise, which should be a valuation analysis or economic analysis. And yet they able to say with a straight face. When I talk about cyclic work, which is which was documented. You mentioned earlier we could likely get deflation, if not disinflation. What does well during these periods? In other words, which asset classes or sectors do well, historically speaking, during disinflationary, if not deflationary periods? Gold did well during the deflationary period of, of the 1930s simply because the price of gold was fixed by the U.S. government. So the companies that mine gold saw that costs going down due to deflation. They saw the wages going down due to, price, to wage deflation. But the, the asset they were selling was remaining stable because it's fixed by the U.S. government. So people use that as evidence that, that gold will do well during the deflationary period. I think during the deflationary period, really nothing will do well. We're still long gold because of the market action. If I see a turn in gold, we're going to get out of gold. I think Bitcoin will do poorly during the deflationary period. And uh, again, we, we recommend a short Bitcoin also. We're up 6% on a short recommendation, only on a 1% position. Because we're seeing markets all over turning. We're not strictly seeing the U.S. stock market turning. We're seeing a shift in, in, in optimism to negativism, a shift in liquidity to illiquidity, and that should affect um, everything. Now, uh, honestly, we are still long gold, and we're long the gold miners. They're still doing well. But you know, if I see evidence that that's going to turn down along with the market, we'll do that as well. So to answer your question, it's very difficult to find something that does well in deflationary spiral, except of course, cash does well. Or, or, or uh, you know, if you lend money to an entity that's able to pay back the interest, that will do well. You, you know, if you want to buy a treasury bond or short term, uh, get five percent on a short term. That, that makes a lot of sense because in the deflationary period, you'll do very, very well doing that. But uh, and that's again assuming that the that the Federal Reserve is going to maintain a, a real currency as opposed to what they've done in Venezuela, Argentina. What what in bonds also do well if let's say interest rates drop during disinflationary periods? Bonds should do very well unless there's a question whether the United States will be able to pay off the loans. I don't think that is a question. The United States can get plenty, plenty of income. The only problem is they overspend. You have to get some great presidents, like some great great uh, Congress to just cut spending and let the income come in and and, and the United States could do fine. But uh, will that happen or not? We don't know. But I don't think the United States is a credit risk. So I don't think, uh, I think, uh, yes, bonds should do well in a deflationary period. Yes, I do think so. Uh, final question, Milton. Uh, this has been a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Bitcoin, you mentioned Bitcoin. Are you trading Bitcoin where would you be trading Bitcoin like a leverage play on the NASDAQ? We, have, I have a very negative view on Bitcoin. And it's very strange because Bitcoin, it's, it, 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 it's, it's basically, it's a speculative entity. There's no way to describe it because unlike gold, which has a use, you know, people use it for jewelry. It's a, it's an attractive thing. It's used industrial or, or other monetary. Anything, anything in the past that's been used for money has had a use. Now, the, the, uh, Bitcoin is just a ledger. And it could be a ledger. You know, no reason for Bitcoin is worth a hundred thousand dollars or worth two thousand dollars. It could do. It could have the same. It could be. It, 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 it could just be just as effective. There's no reason for the price of Bitcoin to go up, except for the fact that people are buying Bitcoin because it goes up. So I think in a in a broad decline in, in markets worldwide, Bitcoin should decline as well. You trade it with your own risk. We told our clients oh, we got we got short them in in March. Let me give you, tell you what we that we we went short through the Bitcoin future BTPITO. Uh, give me one second. XBT currency GPO. We got short. We're, we got short Bitcoin a, a couple of days off its high. And basically, we told our clients if it trades above the March 14th, a high of 7315, 7.29 by 10 cents, you just get out of your short position. I think we're up six or seven percent on a short position in Bitcoin. We'll see what happens. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pound the table uh, you know and say take a huge position. One of the problems with Bitcoin, as you know, is Unlike other assets that get overvalued, any stock gets overvalued, the company can issue more shares. And and or or but Bitcoin, they're not really not issuing more shares. It, 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 fixed, it fixed the number of Bitcoin that's going to be around. So you don't have maybe you don't have the natural sellers. But on the other hand, on, as far as speculation goes, as far as the psychology in Bitcoin, it is so over the top. I mean, what I hear about people, it's it's some it it, it, it comes some sort of a monetary religion. And I say religion because there's no logic to it. There's no reason why 
a paper cup can't have a value of thirty thousand dollars if you limited the supply of paper cups. So, so it, just the fact that there's an entity with a limited supply that can't be can't be uh, counterfeited, there's no reason for it to trade at high prices. Maybe there's a reason for it to use it as a ledger, but but that's just my opinion. And at this point, we're short Bitcoin. Hopefully, Bitcoin declines fifty percent, and we'll say we went short one percent, and we made fifty percent on the decline. We'll see what happens. Where can we learn from you and MB Advisors? Well, mainly our clients are institutional clients or some some family offices. Um, our work is sort of unique and um, it limited. It's limited to the, the, the clientele. Limited. I'm going to be publishing a book, which I've you know I've been delaying. But when I publish the book, there'll be more of this information. We have over thirty thousand indicators we track. We 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 we, we tra track these right out of the box. We have a good. We have a, a, a strong. Uh, um, uh, understanding of market history and um, uh, anyone wants to contact us it's, uh, it's miltonberg.com it's, they can send an email to info at miltonberg.com and um, by the way we do uh, publish things in Twitter we never did in, in the past but we delay it we're generally at least a month behind in our Twitter feed so if, you, if someone can get an idea of what we look at and what, some of the kind of you're talking about we excerpt some of our reports in Twitter but it's not on a timely basis so for example uh, sometimes you look at Twitter, you think we're bullish, we'll actually return. But just to get an idea of our, our process, uh, Twitter would help. Actually, in Twitter, we in the last week or so, we did publish a strong uh, explanation of the um, Montgomery cycle. So somebody may want to see that to get an understanding of that as well. Okay, perfect. So follow the links down below to uh, learn more from Milton. Thank you very much for your time today, Milton. We'll speak again soon. Thank you.